Voce de corridoio. I've heard something in the corridor. No, la verità, it's the truth. Rico Ioani has re-signed with the New Zealand Rugby Union. Four more years, George Gregan, four more years. That's what we're gonna say to you guys. But I'm loving it. You know why? Because he actually said he's staying for the legacy. He's staying to achieve some more goals. And that, as an ex All Black, makes me incredibly proud. Thanks, Rico. I hope a whole lot more follow. Such good news. And you heard it right here on The Breakdown. Yeah! Tēnā koutou katoa, good evening and welcome into The Breakdown. JK is exactly right. Breaking news on The Breakdown today. It is a big commitment from one of the world's best players in Rico Ioane, signing on until the 2027 Rugby World Cup in Australia. His signature would have literally been wanted around the globe, so to keep him in New Zealand is massive. Sir John Kerwin, back in the hot seat tonight. Whaono, Ken Laban, great to have you joining us, Ken. And Jeff Wilson as well. Uh, immediate reactions to this news, JK... Rico signing, but the way he signed him, him wanting to build on this legacy in New Zealand. Yeah, I was actually quite emotional about it, Goldie, to be fair. I mean, you know, I understand that people have to look after their futures and, and um, you know, there's big financial rewards, Ken, overseas. But for him to say, you know, my, my legacy, our legacy, which for me is the All Blacks, I want to achieve some goals, um, for me just thought, wow, that's so good. So good for me, Ken, that... We're getting some of these guys who are important because we need um, a new era, I believe, after this World Cup. Yeah, well, he's the best centre in the world. I think, mm. you know, I think you alluded to that. Um, Kirsty, it's a massive signing, confidence-wise, uh, because it adds some stability. Um, obviously, from an all-black and from a blues perspective um, as well, because he'll retain, obviously, his connection um, with the blues. But he's a fabulous player. And remember, he went straight from the Auckland Grammar first 15 to uh, New Zealand Sevens, hadn't played any senior footy, then he went from a Sevens, he was fast-tracked to um, Super Rugby, fast-tracked to the All Blacks before he'd even played uh, NPC. So identified at a very young age, which we're going to talk about later on in the programme. And um, as, I, as I said previously, the best player in his position in the world. I have so much respect for this decision because he would have had to sacrifice a lot to make that decision. Now, in 2025, he is going to take a sabbatical. He's going to go and earn... A, a, a well-earned amount of money, but he's committed for four years. That's two Rugby World Cups, which tells me that he respects and understands what his legacy in the All Black jersey could be, JK. And that's why I think it means so much, because this is, this is the sort of people... He joins a list of players now, to me, that are committed and dedicated to making the All Blacks better. It's not about them. It's about enhancing and being part of something really special. And my respect for him and the players around him who want to be part of this group going forward, it is fantastic. It is great news. I love the leadership. Proud of him. And not just for the fact it doesn't just help the All Blacks, it also helps the Blues and Super Rugby as well. You don't mind the sabbatical clause in the contract going overseas for a year? If that's what it needs to keep them at the moment, I would like to see the, the whole sabbatical thing looked at. Mm. Um, you know, do they need a rest more than a sabbatical? But I think it's a financial thing, so we'll, we can talk about that later. The other thing I like about Rico is he's worked really hard to get better. You know, Goldie, you and I played on the wing. He was an outstanding winger, Ken, when he first came Best in, in the world. And he, the best and in the world. Totally. Best in the world at wing. He's transformed to centre. And wasn't easy for him to start with, but he's worked really hard on his game. So, yeah, I just think it's one of those signings that's, that's going to help others sign. And once again, you know, the Blues traditionally in the last 10 years have had players like this that do leave early. You know, you think about uh, Stephen Luatua, you think about Charles Piatau, you know, those guys have left. Um, even Malani Nainai, who's actually back now, but to have that stability, leadership within the Blues, hopefully that'll get a whole lot more guys to stay. Well, we've North. been talking, oh, sorry, Ken, about this exodus of players uh, around the world, but we've actually got a list of players that are staying in New Zealand. Rico Ioane is one of two that are staying through to the next Rugby World Cup. Samasoni Tokiaho is on that list as well. But there's some big names on here, Ken, the likes of a Joe Moody, a Sam Kane signing through to 2025. What do you think of this list and the future of New Zealand rugby in the All Blacks right now? Well, firstly, when you look at the quality of that list, it's hard to leave the subject of sabbatical out of the conversation. Uh, there are only limited funds from a New Zealand perspective in terms of being able to play these players, to pay the players what they're physically worth. 
countries like Japan, 127 million uh, population and obviously an economy that reflects that size and a professional game uh, where they can earn three times what they can earn here. So, you know, using the sabbatical in a positive way to, uh, to enhance the earnings of the play, you know, of the players. We understand all that, but, you know, as JK raises, you know, the issue of the sabbatical versus fatigue versus keeping them fresh for their first priority, which is New Zealand, is a separate conversation. And I think that's pretty significant when you add into that list someone like Enrico Iwani. This is not a young player. This is a guy who's played, I think, 59 test matches and he's got vast amounts of experience. And for the next four years, he's going to be hopefully fit and available to be selected, whether it be at centre or on the wing. And when you look at that group of players, when transitioning into a new era of the game, New Zealand rugby have been clear about that. They're changing the coach, they're changing the coaching staff, they're looking at all of their aspects around how they approach all of their teams in black, so JK. So I look at this group and I go, you know what, to have the level of commitment we have from these guys and the level of talent, and I'm sure there's going to be some other names that will get added to this list, but to me we've had it from these guys already, how desperate they are to be all blacks, and that's critical if you're going to get the best out of them. Yeah, look, and I think transition for Razor, there's a couple of names up there, Sam Kane, Cody Taylor, mm. who are now in their 30s. That transition next year, I think the, that Razor will need to take some risks with young, younger guys. Some guys that haven't signed, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. Um, but you do need to transition. And some of those guys, like Sam Kane, Cody Taylor, might not make the next World Cup, but they can transition you straight after a World Cup when you're inbreeding some of these. But Rico's right in the middle. You know, he should be now going, full, if he's not already, right into the leadership group, right into sort of saying, I'm now going to take control of the back line. You're probably going to have a new first five for the sounds of things. Well, there's some players that haven't signed, right? And there were no first fives on that list currently. As it stands, we know that Bowden Barrett will be in Japan next year for one year. Richie Moonga will also be in Japan for the next three years. Damien McKenzie, yet to sign in New Zealand. Ken, uh, who do you think is the most important signature for New Zealand rugby to add to that future list? Oh, Damien McKenzie, 100%. He's the player. Obviously, if Bowden's not around and Richie is not around, well, who's going to drive the team? Um, on top of that... Um, he, the way that he's been playing uh, this year, his footwork, his passing, his vision, and of course one thing he's never lacked is confidence. Uh, he's got that ability now when he's playing for the Chiefs, he goes, every time he goes to the line he's got multiple options to offload the ball to. You know, it's not something that we've seen previously, but you know, he's playing in a very slick outfit, well coached, well programmed with a great game plan. And look here, he can go right, left, back down the middle, always got that option. And of course as we know he's a magnificent runner. The thing I like, Goldie, is we've been talking about innovation, right? We talk about innovation, I actually think he's brought it, whether it's because of the way he plays, and I talk about this every week. He plays like a rugby league standoff, so he's running laterally at times. Running straight often, but laterally at times, with guys cutting, guys coming in different angles, and I just think that's what the game needs. So are we actually seeing the new modern first five in Damien McKenzie. But to answer your question, Kirsty, sign him tomorrow. Damien, please sign. <laughs> please sign with Rico. You want him to sign with the Blues, that's why, JK. You get, you get your own opening. You'll get your own opening from JK on breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> You'll do the next one in Swahili. Uh, well, no, he's really, he is fundamental, I believe, because while he might not be the number one for this World Cup, he's definitely our number... If we're going to play Bowden at fullback, he's definitely our number two. Mm. So we spoke about it before. Um, if Richie Moanga is going, Wong is going, then there's a big pot there. So just use it on Damien. Let's find out about the pot. Well, let's find out because we have immediate reaction to the news from New Zealand Rugby with the General Manager of Professional Rugby, Chris Lindrum. Chris, it's so great to have you joining us on The Breakdown and we thank you so much for being with us on a Sunday. We know how much our players are valued across the world and there were other offers for Rico Ioane. So what were some of the challenges with keeping him in New Zealand? Oh, well, kia ora, Kirsty, and kia ora, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on, obviously, first of all. Uh, good news, yeah, tonight for us with Rico um, signing, we're, we're thrilled, obviously. Um, I think Rico is very representative of um, a number of our players. He's come into the game at a very young age. Uh, he's... Um, played a lot for the Blues uh, and for the All Blacks in the time that he's been with us. And he still seems like a young man to, to many of us as fans and, and spectators. But like all of these uh, elite players, he had a lot of options in front of him. Um, and so to have him stay for four years is a real coup.
uh, Chris, if, if if we wanted to keep all our players, realistically, do we, do we have the funds? Do we literally have the money with Inside New Zealand Rugby to keep these players? Well, I think you can see from what you've discussed already tonight that we've got enough money to have a really fair crack at keeping all of the most significant players. We can't keep everybody. Um, that's been the case for a number of years now. Uh, and will probably remain the case, to be fair, just because we're not the top of the market financially. Um, I heard you talking before about uh, Japan, France, um, the, the clubs and corporations and those competitions have a significant amount of money to throw around for our best players uh, and sometimes our up-and-coming players. So we can keep them all, um, but the lure of the All Black jersey is still really strong for players, and you can see that in Rico's decision tonight. Nendo, congratulations, mate. That's starting to look like a pretty good list, which makes all us older All Blacks feel a little bit better about the next four years. But has any of the Silver Lake money trickled down to help you uh, retain the players yet, or is that still to come? Uh, still to come, largely. We've made decisions around the Silver Lake investment. Um, that's really for capital investment, not for operating expenditure. So that includes player salaries. What we hope, obviously, in time is that New Zealand rugby uh, can generate more revenue and then that will flow down in our revenue share arrangements to the players. Um, but for right now, we've obviously got a few long servants leaving at the end of 2023. Um, to your point about Damo JK just before I came on, um, that does free up our ability to um, invest a bit more in this next tier of leadership. Chris, it's Ken Laban, uh, mate, well done on um, Odd Record. Just a question around some of the internal politics that are involved at the moment with um, an incumbent coaching group about to depart um, the World Cup and then signing players post the World Cup. How are you managing that situation? Yeah, good question, um, Ken. And it, it is a new situation for us, obviously. We've put ourselves in this situation, so I'm, I'm certainly not... Uh, not complaining, but, but it, it is a tricky dynamic. Um, uh, in terms of looking ahead, you know, it's really important that we give Razor and um, what will be his incoming group a voice in the talent that we retain for the World Cup cycle that they'll be coaching, right? So um, he's primarily focused on coaching the Crusaders and trying to win uh, yet another Super Rugby title this year. Um, and so we're just getting access to him when we can around the margins and in the background um, and, and certainly yeah, he's involved um, but we still utilise um, the current group as well you know they're really senior experienced group of coaches um, yeah, a high performing group and um, they've still got a lot of value to add Lindo what sort of percentage of sacrifice are these top players having to make to stay home you know is it 50% 60% that they're giving up to stay home and look after the legacy and look after the all-black jersey? Well, I think there's two sides to it, right? There's generally a financial gap. Um, I don't think for those really elite players, JK, it's not 50%. Um, it's probably 10 to 30%. Um, so it's, it's not immaterial. Um, but when you combine the value that we can offer, which is a for these senior players, um, elite all-blacks, it's a great wage by any standard um, uh, in New Zealand terms. Uh, and, and then the All Blacks the, and the ability to play for the All Blacks on top of that. You know, that's a pretty special package and, and that's why you're seeing all of these guys coming again. Endo, I mean, we talk about it often after a World Cup cycle about experienced All Blacks heading overseas. This eligibility to play for the All Blacks is that something that you review on a regular basis? And how do you go about that? And how do you consider when the time might be right to look overseas if by necessity you need a vastly experienced player who's gone? Well, the first part of your question, uh, Goldie, yeah, we do. We review all the time. Every year to two years, we re-look at our eligibility policies for national team selection. And that's, that's not just all blacks, but obviously the shop window um, in, in the player retention area is, is the All Blacks because that's where the market's hottest. Um, so we look at our 
our own circumstances, um, money available. We look at market trends. We look at what other countries are doing, obviously. Um, but we also look at some key touchstones, which are we want strong domestic competitions, strong super rugby teams, uh, and our best players playing in New Zealand because we believe that's where we can prepare them the best to play for the All Blacks. And that obviously has a knock-on effect to the performance of the national team. So, look, we'll be... We'll be due again to have a look at it, um, probably after the World Cup. Uh, and um, you know, but I think the other thing I'd say is y you move too quickly in this space at your peril. Um, I, I know you're on record as being a bit of a supporter of the ghetto law or something similar um, for uh, New Zealand to look at, and absolutely that's something that we might consider in the future. But sitting where I do, um, it's probably a bit of a last resort for us. Maybe one day that's our future, but I'm not in a hurry to get to that future. When you've got the uh, talent that we have stacking up here, committing to play in the next World Cup cycle and looking through to 2027, um, there's just no rush for us to move there. We don't need to, and as long as we can hold out uh, as we are, we'll keep doing that. Chris, the Hurricanes CEO has come out urging New Zealand rugby uh, to announce the assistant coaches of the All Blacks for next year and beyond so that if it does include their head coach, they can obviously make plans. When will we hear about the assistants? Yeah, not too far away, Kirsty. Uh, 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 it's probably a matter of weeks, certainly not months. We're, we're moving as fast as we can. I know there's... Um, uh, a lot of talk about it, obviously, publicly um, in the media and around the water cooler and so forth. Um, what I'd say is, obviously, um, these are people, um, these are their careers, uh, whether they're in the existing management group or keen to join the new one. Um, that means we've got employment processes and, and also just uh, a desire to really um, act in accordance with our values as an organisation, which is people first. So all of these conversations take a bit of time. We know that our clubs will be in a hurry because if they are impacted, they want to get on into the market and, um, and, and pick up a new coach or promote from within, whatever it might be. Um, so we're working as hard as we can um, and uh, you should see some news reasonably soon, I'd say. Well, thank you very much for your time, Chris, uh, and brilliant job in the re-signing of Rico Ioane for the next four years as well. Congratulations. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, everyone. Ka kite. Ka kite. Thank you so much. Chris Lindrum joining us there. Uh, he's with New Zealand Rugby. He is the General Manager of Professional Rugby, so he deals with contracting all the All Blacks players. There's a lot to discuss after that one, but first, he said it will be weeks, not months, before the All Blacks assistant coaches are unveiled. Um, the money question. He said there's enough money to have a serious crack at these players, but we can't keep them all. That is the reality. Yeah, that's the reality. I mean, the market is so strong right now for New Zealand players and it has been that for a long time and Japan in particular um, has certainly strengthened JK you'd know more than I about that but it, it, it's clear to me that they've got a strategy here New Zealand rugby they've certainly made an investment in the game and they've brought some more capital into the game which hasn't been realized to your point and that's why you asked the question JK but what happens over the next probably a couple of months with a, a lot of these key positions and we, you talked about that first five and, and where we might be strong and what we might like. I look at this group, I still really like what we've got. I agree with them, but at some point, if we get challenged, whether it be through injury, whether it be through reform, and there are players who are overseas, maybe it's time to just look at the possibility if we need them on a short-term basis. Yeah, well, I could have cooked kept Chris on for another half an hour because yeah. there's so many other questions. I mean, we will have an un another Nani Laumapi who left, Ken, you know, one of your boys, and I know you were sad that day. He probably wasn't the finished package yet. We, he reminded us all of of, uh, of Ma'a Nonu. You know, Charles Piatau, Stephen Luatua left in their primes. Those guys will happen. It will happen. But I think what we've got to go talk about is if there's a certain pot of money, we need to make sure we target the right guys. Damien McKenzie, Damien McKenzie, Damien McKenzie, <laughs> target the right guys. You know. But there's also holes, and I think this is what you're getting to. I don't like the ghetto rule. Mm. I, I do not like it, Goldie. I just don't like it. Um, but I think there could be a one-off situation. We've already seen them sort of tickle their way into that, you know, Patrick Tupolotu. 
Well, the guys who have come back. Well, the guys who have been on sabbatical have come straight back in. But there are guys, Ken, who have taken a contract overseas, which Damien McKenzie was one, and he came back last year and then was only eligible once again. When yeah, can you explain signed. that? Can you explain that properly to people, please? Because people well, don't understand. Contract. There's well, two different. You're off right? yeah, sabbatical you're off and yeah. you're off contract. Well, sabbatical, you're still signed with New Zealand Rugby. So when you come back from your sabbatical, you can be selected straight away. Whereas, and that's based on form, but when you're off contract, in which Damien McKenzie, TJ Piranara did the same, they went and played in Japan, then they returned, and for them to be eligible once again for the All Blacks, they had to sign a contract, and they had to play, and so they were Is that what Bowden Barrett's doing? Well, that's what he could possibly do. Is that another, uh, one of your voices in the corridor? Is that what you're hoping? I'm or not saying. You're not saying? Not just yet? Ian, I'm not saying, well, but I'd you're... sign Bowden Barrett straight away. Well, there's no salary cap in Japan, that's the first thing. And you know more than you know more than the rest of us on the panel. Um, JK. Hamm 14 million US to 30 million, 35 million US is what the player is what the uh, clubs spend per, per club. Yep. Per club. So what they can earn, what they end up with. So it's three, four times what they can earn here. So I completely understand if somebody like Bowden wanted to go, um, sign a long-term contract and stay up in Japan. It's a great culture, beautiful people. The money's terrific, and the footy's not as competitive. So you know physically he'll be. Um, he'll be OK. Also, you know, you have to put Jerome, uh, Ma and Sonny Bull in that same sabbatical category as well because New Zealand rugby couldn't afford to pay them what they were worth, gave them sabbaticals. They went up to Japan, <coughs> million dollars for one season, all three of them. <laughs> they came back richer for the experience, richer financially, yep. and then all contributed significantly to helping us win the World Cup in 2015. So it hasn't been a barrier to, you know, ongoing success for us either. I want to know how many millions that was. But, JK, you asked the question, how much percentage are these players? Is giving up. Chris said 10 to 30%. Are you surprised by that number? You thought it was a lot more. No, no, I thought it'd be around that for the top guys. The I top think it's, guys, it's right. the guys like Nani, it's the guys like Pietau who, who we've lost already that are actually, someone's come in and said, we'll pay you what you should have thought you were getting as an All Black. They get a million, I think Charles Pietau got a million dollars back then, right? Yep. So it's those guys we'll lose where they go, actually, but still, when you think about it, that level, 30%, that's still three or $400,000 you're talking about that you're giving up to stay home. And they are the discussions we have to have now, Ken, because it is a professional sport. You need, you've got a small period of time. I mean, Steve Hansen brought up a good thing, and maybe we should go and see the government about it. If you live in Ireland... Um, no tax. No, you get your tax back at the end, like a pension. So they give you the tax that you've paid. Not all of it, but like instead of paying 35%, you pay 25 and they give you that back in a lump sum. That's why you don't leave Ireland. I just wanted to change direction a little bit on the subject of the upcoming announcement of the assistant coaches. Mm. So what does that mean for Dave Rennie, two-time Super Rugby winner? Chris Boyd, director of rugby at the Highlanders now, one-time Super Rugby winner. Ross Philippe and Leo Crowley, the last two to win the, to win the NPC. Warren Gatlin, Wayne Pivak, Pat Lamb. Just saying. At Joe Schmidt as well. Don't Joe Schmidt. The fact that he said what he's not, he's gonna, not gonna be available for the All Blacks. You've got Tony Brown as well, Jamie Joseph. You've got guys who are coming to the end of the cycle at a Rugby World Cup. So there could be people out there, but once again, is that is that their future? W where would they see it going if you're going to be a head coach of Super Rugby? Are, are you back in? He's oh, hold back on, I know you know. Back back in. In. And Sir John Kerwin, add that name to the list. Okay. Are you back? No, I'll just put him in the hand. Should we coach a game? Oh, no, 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 I'm putting my hand in the league. That's what I was useless last, last, last time. Yeah. I could, Give me Ken. I could yell and abuse yeah. him and you guys. We're good on tour, though. I'm not being your media manager. What I'm saying is. Look, what I'm saying is. What I'm saying is. Um, young players, and you named a, a couple of young coaches, you named a couple of them. But some of them, you know, are they, do they want to coach the All Blacks? Dave Rennie, if he wants to coach the All Blacks, then he needs to come back. If he doesn't, right, then he needs to go where the money is, because the money will be ridiculously different at coaching level, yep. right? You're talking 20 times more, Ken. So some of these young guys we need to give a crack because coaches like players need to see a pathway to stay because those coaches have the same choices in Japan. So there's two. I think Dave Rennie will probably have a huge contract in Japan or overseas again. And if he comes home, it means he's still got ambition. And he might still be under contract with well, the, Australia. He'll have ambition. Well, there's potentially three head coaching Super Rugby jobs available, right? And we've got the CEO of the Blues joining us a little bit later on. So we'll ask him about these potential coaches and what they're looking to do if Leon McDonald does, in fact, go next year. But it's time now for our Form 15. We love doing this segment. You've been handed the reins this week, Ken, uh, because you have seen all of our All Blacks, not just All Blacks, but other international players come through 
rugby, come through schoolboy rugby, Land Rover first 15 over the last 13 years, and you've picked your very best form 15. Yes, well, it hasn't been uh, hasn't been easy. Some of the selections, some would some would think are um, some would think are controversial. But uh, Will Jordan, well, the first time I saw Will, he scored five tries for Christchurch Boys High uh, in their annual fixture against uh, against Christ College, which is a very very big event. Um, in your front row, I see all of a sudden you've got someone who, who's not available for the All Blacks. That's right. Well, we're talking about school boys, Tony Yellow to Pole. But still, I mean, was he the best loose head prop you ever saw? Was he a tight there? I don't know. I don't know if he was. I don't know if he was the best front rower um, that I saw. But oh, what a magic! There he is in Sacred Heart. You just love commentating that. You just love commentating. My now, son. Right? My son. My son went to school with. Taniella? Yeah, Taniella was 132 kilos. My son was 72. Well, look at that. Well, my son was captain of the soccer team. Look at him flying down that right edge. <laughs> I, I remember watching that. It's going to look great for the All Blacks. Oh, he's a wallaby. Has he <laughs> kicked on? Has he kicked on, Ken? Has he kicked on? Well, like I don't him? know. Do you call well, making it a Super Rugby and playing for Australia and playing at the elite level? It's kicked on. Is that kicked on? Yep. Or do you regard he yep. needs to win something of significance? So who you got here? Who else in your middle row? Yes, Scott, Pat, um, Scott Barrett, obviously, and uh, Patrick Tupolotu. Scott went to Francis Douglas. Paddy went to St Peter's. And there's, what have we got there? Auckland Grammar, Sacred Heart, St Kennigan. JK, you didn't pick this team, did you? Because it's very blue. Yeah. It's, it's the two who played blue. lock. And so the two played lock for, for Sacred Heart. Yeah, yeah so... I see. I have. I've seen Brad Weber, Napier Boys High. Hang on, can I just stop you right there? You can, uh, especially you, Ken. Yes. <laughs> um, so Brad Weber and TJ Peranata. I mean, so the reason are your nephews? Well, TJ is. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I went for love for Falau Fakatava, I thought it was very important that Hastings Boys High School are uh, represented. They ran oh, okay. a fabulous first fifteen. Uh, program and they won the top four. Oh, this is against Hamilton. Hamilton boys is Falau Fakatava as a schoolboy at Hastings Boys High. A number of kids out of that team, Flanders, um, has gone on to play Super Rugby um, as well. Danny Toala has gone on to play Super Rugby. Lincoln McClutchy was out of that same Hastings Boys High first 15. And the coach, Mark Osich, who went from Hastings Boys to Hawke's Bay. So the reason I chose for Lowell was so that I could acknowledge Hastings Boys High's success the at first 15 level. The midfield. I love your 12. Oh. I love your 12. <laughs> That's awesome. Artie Savier, well, exactly. He was the Rongatai College second 5'8 in his final year at school at uh, Rongatai College, where he was also head boy. He was also in the Polynesian group. He's also very, very good in the, Mar in the um, performing arts and music areas. Very, very talented. Can dance. Good. Oh, yeah. Can, can move. Can dance, can sing. Uh, and, of course, uh, Roger Tuivas Tuivasashek. He was captain of Otahu, Otahu First 15. Here's a question. Center. Here's a question. 20 minutes to go, World Cup final. Our backs have all been injured. Would you put them out there then? I would. Who, Artie? Or you? Yeah, Roger. 12. No, 12. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, 12, mate. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter the what backs are down. The We've got no one left. Let's put them, left. Put Just put them out anywhere. there. You can play anywhere. Yeah. Okay, right on. You're back three. You're back three. Anywhere. And you're you back three. the rest of your team for us. Oh, well, obviously, Rico Ioane and Caleb, Caleb Clark. Caleb played a lot of wing. Uh, man played a lot in the midfield, but his preference was always to play on the left wing, even when he was at Mount Albert. Uh, Grammar. Rico played a lot in the midfield at Auckland Grammar. In fact, Sean Stevenson was in that same Auckland Grammar first 15. Yep. Sean was the fullback. Rico was, um, Rico was in the midfield. And Akira was uh, number eight. Right, question. Scott Barrett, the best of the Barretts you saw? Oh, big call. And, so, and there's more than, there's more than just Geordie. I Jordy. watched Geordie play once for Francis Douglas and it was like, kicked a goal from 50. was outstanding. That's yeah. a big call there. Bowden Barrett, yeah, Kane Barrett as well. Did you see him or not? Yeah, Kane and Scott played in the same era. Same era, right? So... Kane was good. Yeah, Kane was really good. Don't ask me a question like that. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to be in the middle <laughs> of. of the I don't want to be in the middle of a Fano split <laughs> by split. forcing me to. Because I heard Vojtěk Kodidoyo that Smiley brought you a beer last night too. <laughs> he did. He did too, and I might, I might see him in the next couple of weeks. No, that's a fact. La verita, la verita, Krista, la verita. Multiple players that came out of Francis Douglas Memorial College, though, right? That we've seen in, in Super Rugby. It was another one of these feeder teams. Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's exactly. Not all of them ended up playing for Taranaki either. All <laughs> ended up playing, you know, those boys went straight to Christchurch. You'll have one, though, on your radar right now who's just sitting or not far off that you've seen in, that's maybe just gone into Super Rugby. Is there one you're going, you know what? I knew that all along. 
Um, probably the most exciting in that category, I'd have to say Peyton Spencer. Right. Uh, he's just been added to the New Zealand Sevens team. I think he's yeah, played good. three or four mm. tournaments, but he's been playing 15. Uh, been playing fullback for Hamilton Boys, and again, it come through that same program. That's Quinn Tupai, Josh Lord yeah. have come through that same, you know. Yep. Yeah, terrific kid. I don't know how you picked a form 15. From 13 cool. years. Well, Goldie changes the rules every week about <laughs> every week. 15 is. So. Actually, this wasn't my about idea. I had yeah, nothing to do with that. It started as a super, super, well, uh, super uh, rugby competition. Six, just four. make your own rules, though, mate. Don't worry about us. <laughs> what f yeah, exactly. I will. You wait till we do the law exam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, right. that's still to come. We actually put these two to the test to see how well they know uh, the rugby laws because they are constantly attacking them and telling us we need to change a few things. So we'll put them to the test shortly. Plus, we chat to the CEO of the Blues, Andrew Hoare, and we chat uh, the future for Moana Pacifica. A player who is tackled in the opponent's in goal may get up and move towards the goalpost to score a try. True or false? There's mi missing a detail. 100% missing a detail. Missing a detail. Yeah, whether he's held or not. Yeah and whether he releases the ball and then picks it up again, which is the law? Uh, no. What do you mean, no? No, you don't have to release the ball if you're not held. Did you try that when you were playing, the old fake put down and go around the post? Yeah, I told the ref before the game. Oh, what was it? So yeah. I put it on, so I put it on my foot. Is that within the spirit of the game? <laughs> that was pretty, that's not pretty good when I scored down the other end of the oh, game. No, that was, that I was no, in no, good was... spirit. Yeah, no, they kicked it into the 22. Yeah, and then go And on. I put it on my foot. foot which is not down, everyone stopped, and then I walked back to the 22 and then took off. Did you? Yeah. That is well and truly not in the spirit of the game. I wonder what other, Tatum, other we things also, we this also, Auckland crowd used in the late also, 80s, early 90s to win all of those games, gave away penalties in front of your line. How many times? How many times do you reckon those players would have got yellow cards in your day? I oh, unbelievable. Never. Did you actually tell the rest of your team you were going to do this? Yeah. Oh, you did tell them? So there's three, three things that we did. The quick throw-in in the World Cup. Yeah. Told the ref for that. Never been done before. That one on the foot. And the other one... Were you going to try and pull it out in a test match? Yeah. I, I, I was just so dying to. <laughs> oh, I would love to have seen that. Well, that was a little snippet, but I tell you what, stick around until 8.30pm on Sky Sport 1. I promise you, you, you so will not me. be so, disappointed. You so annoyed me this, that day. You were so annoyed. It's the first time they, ah, the year. That's confirmation. Actually... That's confirmation you're both idiots. <laughs> <laughs> right there. For half an yeah. hour. You're out of TV. For a full we hour. We won't be resting oh, in the <laughs> Is it an hour? It is a full oh, hour, oh, and Lord. these two officially oh, sit okay. the referee <laughs> exam. So they won't be able to throw <laughs> shade at our top referees after you watch them for the full hour from 8.30 till 9.30pm. PM. Well, if you think JK was happy about the re-signing of Rico Ioane for the next four years, one person that is even happier is the Blues CEO, Andrew Hoare. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us and a massive congratulations. It is awesome news for the Blues uh, and for New Zealand rugby. What is the value of having a marquee player like a Rico Ioane? Does it get extra bums on seats? Yeah, it does. I think uh, the Aratipa report even a couple of years ago highlighted the fact that you've got to have your best players in the country playing. Um, and we're delighted that uh, it's come through you know, a lot of hard work for the union, but there's also a significant contribution, a lot of hard work um, from the Blues as well uh, with Rico. But it is so vitally important that um, young people can see uh, these athletes week in, week out uh, playing Super Rugby. Hori, mate, do you think that Super Rugby can actually create enough revenue to help retain our players? You understand the pressure with Japan and so... If so, how do we do that? Yeah, I, I think we can. I, I think um, if you look at the NFL, AFL, uh, NRL, um, you know, NRL was earning, what, five, 15 million in 1996. It now earns over 400 million a year. Uh, if you look at our revenues, the, four, the, the five supers are working hard together. We've increased our revenue substantially. So I think the, the key to it, though, so, so do I believe it can? Yes, I do. I think it's going to take that separation of governance uh, away from, uh, so it's still nationally uh, body owned, but but run independently. I think that's going to be really important. I think we need to have competitive fixtures. So looking at the way we even those teams up is going to be vitally important. Um, I think that, you know, we we desperately underspend in events uh, and, and marketing side of things when you compare us to some of those other competitions. 
you know, Super Rugby collectively at the moment puts in around $28 million a year back into the high-performance rugby economy, and I, I, I just can't see how uh, we need to sell the opportunity, I think, through to a national bodies that um, if we can, you know, give us licence and the ability to do the things we need to do and the investment into the into the competition, yeah, I do, I genuinely believe, do believe we can get Super back to being number one competition in the world. <clears throat> Uh, Andrew, as Ken Laban, mate, that issue you raise of um, governance versus independent ownership, and then you have referenced the NFL in your response to um, to JK's question, mate. When you look at a place like the Green Bay Packers, every home game sold out since 1967, um, that they might that may not be a great model in terms of ownership, um, but the majority of those franchises are in private. Private ownership, the the money that they spend on events, marketing, and promos, uh, the match day experience is way beyond what we're able to expose our audience to here. In an ideal world, we would love to see that. And obviously, the signing of players like Rico is one part of it. But fixing up that match day experience, I think you're alluding to, that's another crucial part of growing the audience. Yeah, I think. Look, we are extremely lucky in New Zealand that you can go down to uh, ground between the months of February to the end of June and watch Bowdoin Barrett for, you know, uh, and, and and the likes of Rico for about $25 um, and that kind of thing. The the area, though, I think we all agree is that there needs to be work done. And I think that the key thing, we're sort of half pregnant. We're sort of, you know, we're not cricket that's centrally run, run their high performance hubs. We've now, we're morphing, we're evolving. Um, we've got private ownership, but we also have provincial union ownership and all of the and all the uh, franchises. So we're in a state of evolution and with that comes attention and we've got to work through those those sections. We've got to work out how does governance work in this new world? We've got to work out, you know, the, the people have bought in for a reason because they see value. They want to build this competition. Now, if we don't want to do that and we want to just run them as high performance hubs, um, as we've sort of been through, then you might be better to go back down the cricketing route, but that comes, you know, uh, being very reliant on only all black generated revenue and and there's a limit to that right and so we need to have multiple ways that we can generate that revenue and we see that super rugby uh, and I do genuinely believe in the southern hemisphere the money is there we have a nation with 28 million right on our doorstep struggling a little bit money at the moment from a, a rugby perspective we have Japan potentially that could could join in, the, in in that sort of uh, march towards being the greatest again, and and those things are open, they're available. Um, what it does mean, though, is I think we can't think as if we're just um, five clubs working through to, to NZRU or five in Australia and so on. We've got to think of ourselves as a competition, and we've got to think about how best do you make a competition that's appealing to the public and to the fan, and that's moving away from our traditional roots of being a high performance only sort of product. So when you think about it and, and these marquee players you're talking about and we're starting to, I suppose, secure some more of them, which is fantastic, but we are losing um, some key players as well, hitting overseas. You guys as an organisation, as a group, have decided to change some laws this year, right? What's the response you feel it's been? Do you see a product that is better, that you can build on and work with and you are prepared to modify going forward to attract that fan-centric competition you've been talking about? Yeah, and I think it's a wonderful example of how that, that whole process worked. I, first of all, I think the rules have been great. I think people, the ball and play time, the, the, all the metrics that you'd measure for success are showing that that's been successful. If you look at um, the way that, you know, you're not having those replays after replays for a yellow card, they go off, they get assessed, they're either back on, they're off. And that came about by the 12 clubs getting together with the national bodies um, and working through, okay, what rules aren't working for us as a game to create a spectacle for our fans? What do we need to change? We then had World Rugby uh, also at that meeting. So when they went to the World Rugby table, um, there was logic and to, to at least trial them. And I think that's the power in looking at it as a competition and working together to how do we make this comp better? Um, and as opposed to, well, how do we just make our nation better? Well, we can do that. And, and we're all in a race for talent. Um, that's, you know, you, those one, the names that Ken and, and JK and, and, and Jeff, you were running off before, that's fantastic. And we, we've got to work, we will always have to work uh, in our ecosystem to ensure that we're developing more players than we have positions for because 
I think Steve Hansen probably said it in the early 2000s, we almost need to make four to one. It's a probably now um, probably six to one, um, and you've got a declining community uh, rugby playing population in the male side of the game uh, that we need to reverse and 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 stimulate. And I think there's been some wonderful initiatives that that I know that supers want to support. Our role is to support the provincial unions in that. We can't actually have uh, an actual direct impact on that. Um, but those are the those kind of things. I think the law changes in particular, Jeff, just show what can be done when you are thinking about making a great comp. Andrew, this has been hugely interesting and very informative as well. But just quickly, will Leon McDonald be at the Blues next year? And have you spoken to Dave Rennie? Yeah, we've, I think all of the names that have been banded around, we've either talked about or talked to. So um, I think um, you, you can't shy away from that. Um, at the moment, like I think uh, Evan explained, is you've got to see where things lie with the national team and then from there. So we've got a number of sort of balls in the air. Um, we've spoken uh, quite openly. Leon's been outstanding for our organisation. He's given it a, win and he, given it a winning edge uh, and a propel. That's one option. I think Leon also understands that we also need to secure our future too. Um, we have a really good, what I liked about the conversation before is we've got a really good stable of young coaches coming through. Dan Halagahu, Craig uh, McGrath, um, uh, to, uh, Paul Tito, to say just a, just a few. So we need, uh, what we do know is we need an elder statesman that can help facilitate and bring those people through because the Blues need Blues people coming through their system uh, coaching that Blues team. And so we think we've got a real opportunity to do that. Um, and so we've got a number of balls in the air at the moment. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the programme. Thank you for your honesty. And once again, congratulations on securing Rico Ioane for another four years. Yeah, we're delighted. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Andrew Hoare, CEO of the Blues, joining us. There are two things we need to touch on. The first, uh, the coaching situation, um, and also JK, that he wants Super Rugby to be run by the franchises, not by New Zealand Rugby. I totally agree. I think that gives them the freedom to grow their, um, you know, their business. I think that when they tried to sell the, the Blues last time, there was no one really that wanted to buy it. Everyone looked at it from overseas, but they could not see a television deal. I think we need to create a Heineken Cup. I think the Super Rugby season needs to go all season. I think NPC needs to go semi-professional. They should be paid well at that level, but it needs to go semi-professional so that these guys can build and then help retain budgets. You spoke about it before. Ken, you spoke about you know having a player cap. But then you would be able to keep some, someone like, or help keep someone like Rico Ioane in the game moving forward. So something needs to change. Yeah, well, it, well, it was interesting that he raised the issue of governance versus ownership. Mm. And governance, I assume, he was alluding to the traditional way of um, we wait to the AGM every year and we vote in a new group. They stay for three years or they do their term. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, the private ownership model, which is not without its faults. Those three English clubs in private ownership have gone belly up. Um, in the last year, very, very high profile, owing millions of pounds in unpaid salaries and wages um, to players. But I can understand in the modern um, environment, and then, you know, we, you know, we look at it, the NFL, we look at the NBA, private in the main, they are private ownership uh, models where the decisions are made by a select few. Um, there's no decisions or there's no management by committee. It's all done. People are kept accountable for their roles, and, there's been, and it's been tremendously successful. And uh, we're seeing that, you know, essentially the Brisbane Broncos is a private-owned uh, company. They are the biggest, <clears throat> they're the biggest NRL club. Um, the Dolphins, by comparison, are traditional governance-type model who have been getting phenomenal crowds as well. So, you know, there's, there's, there's I guess, pros and cons with both, um, both different setups. When you get some independence, you get the ability to move quickly? because you can collectively look at what's in the best interest of that game and competition going forward. And so that gives them an opportunity to do that. That's the challenge, though, is all of a sudden it's just releasing the reins a little bit, JK. And that's something New Zealand ranking from time to time. It's not an easy thing to do because it's very difficult to rein those things back in. But I like some of his suggestions. Yeah, look, I think um, the NZR probably moved twice as fast as World <laughs> Rugby, right? You um, bumped into Bill. I, I bumped into Bill and, and Bill watches our show, so... Good to see you, Bill. It's good to see you in Hong Kong. But I also spoke to John Jeffrey and, and Bill about how fast we're moving. 
We've got to move faster. When you look at the NRL, and I keep going back to the NRL, I keep going back to it, the crowds are full, they change their rules very quickly. I believe we can get to that, and I said that to Bill. I believe we can move faster around some of the things that the fans want. Private ownership is, is I heard super teams are a high performance place for our All Blacks. I think there's somewhere in the middle between governance and private ownership and also saying we can live alone. If we have a Heineken Cup site situation, call it whatever you want, and that money goes just to the franchises, but you still have NZR governance, I think we can find a happy medium. We've got a whole show on this, don't we? Because you also mentioned the fact you can make the, com the fixtures more competitive and spread the talent around. So there is drafts, so much, so much more to discuss. Transfer yeah. windows, drafts and all of that. And we will have to do it on another show. But still to come, we talk about Moana Pacifica's historic moment, taking the game and their team back to the Pacific Islands to Samoa for the first time ever. Mills also takes his boys back for the first time. We've got a beautiful story right after the break. Uh, let's talk Super Rugby now with Nurofen, available at Chemist Warehouse. And we are going to stay with the Pacific. Apia Park had more than 8,000 people. You may not have seen it on TV, but it was brilliant for Moana Pacifica and for the people of Samoa, Ken, to have their own Super Rugby team come home. What did you think of the occasion and the game? Well, there are defining moments in the history of our game and there are defining moments in the history of Pacifica. Jeff, you and I were part of the, and I, I want to allude to three, three moments. The first one is the 2015 um, All Black Test against Manu Samoa, where you and I um, were there, and that was a dream realised. We talked about, I remember we talked on the sideline about the late Peter Fatia Lofa um, and his vision and his dream to one day see the All Blacks uh, play there. Sadly, he wasn't there physically, but he was there with us um, in spirit, a couple of years ago, the Reds played the Blues there in a private, privately promoted um, match. But And then the third occasion, obviously, was the Moana Pacifica game um, on the weekend. From a cultural point of view, from an acknowledgement, recognition, respect point of view, we've talked many times in our game about how do we acknowledge, how do we recognise, how do we say thank you to the Pacifica contribution um, to our game. So the moment was more than a game in terms of the match itself. Um, but the occasion itself, and Kirsty did a fantastic job with our Sky crew that were up there uh, presenting and broadcasting the game um, for us. It was another significant moment. Of course, it will now raise the question as, so what? What's the future for, um, you know, professional rugby um, in the islands, um, in, in Samoa? Which is a separate debate from the disappointing season that Moana Pacifica are having on the field. Mm. Maybe a disappointing season off the field, but on the field there are a couple of players that continue to stand out every single week. We're in week eight of Super Rugby and here is our Musashi power player. He's been doing it every week and it is Levi Almour. He's in the papers as well, Jeff and JK, around this eligibility. He's eligible for Tonga, Samoa and New Zealand. Where is he going to end up? Will we see him at the Rugby World Cup in France later this year? Well, the remarkable thing about this is this is not just this season. This was last season as well. He was uh, brought into the All Blacks 15 environment, which doesn't commit him to playing to New Zealand but he, he has admitted himself there is a desire for him he wants to try and represent the All Blacks that's one of his goals but that's not to say he wouldn't have an opportunity so I look at it JK and go you know what it's his choice it's not you know I know he's committed to the side he's playing for right now but if he wants to be an All Black and chase that dream I think he should be allowed to. Uh, what's Moana Pacifica for then? Two things they need to go back Moana Pacifica need to go back and base themselves in Apia and have a couple of games overseas. Um, why is he playing for Moana Pacifica? He's available for New Zealand then. I don't get it. I don't get it. I think he should be available for Samoa Tonga. But I, I thought that's what Moana Pacifica was for, Ken. That is what it's for, isn't it, Ken? Well, if he wants to play for the All Blacks, then he's in now in the conversation with Anton Leonard Brown, Geordie Barrett, and Quinn Tupai, isn't he? So, um, and if you put Levi's name in there, so that's four. Out of those four, they're not going to pick four, are they? You know, so, uh, you know, I know it's a nice talking point, and I know it's very nice, and I know that we're all very, you know, we're all very emotional because it was, uh, but it was terrific. And, of course, the question that JK um, just posed is unanswered um, as well. So what is the purpose of Moana Pacifica if it's not to provide a pathway to international rugby? But it wasn't supposed to be the All Blacks, that was my understanding.
That is all we have time for tonight on The Breakdown. Thank you all so much. Stick around for these two setting the referees exam. I can't believe, like... Good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> <Wait>. like... <laughs>